I am Femi Oke and you're in the stream. Today, a number of cities around the world are taking on climate change and leading the way when it comes to eco-friendly policies. We look at how they're doing it and what we can learn. As that great Muppet environmentalist once said, it's good to be green, but Marika Palau, <laughs> what is our online community say? Well, we wanted to survey them informally, get their thoughts, pick their brains. And so we sent out a poll to our community asking how important it was for them to live in a city with eco-friendly policies. More than 140 people responded, you see here, with 60% saying very important. So there does seem to be a demand online, but we'll talk about the challenges to building so-called green cities, and we want your thoughts. Tweet us with hashtag AJStream. I am Fintan Nutunathamboa, and I'm a Pacific Climate Warrior, and I'm in the stream. 21 climate summits have come and gone over the past two decades with countless calls to action but the international community has yet to come up with a viable agreement on how to protect the environment. Despite this lack of progress at the state level, a number of cities around the world have been making significant strides when it comes to introducing eco-friendly policies. The Green City Index, which measures the environmental performance of over 120 cities across the globe, lists San Francisco as the top performer in North America, Curitiba tops Latin America, Copenhagen in Europe, Singapore in Asia and Cape Town as one of the top performers in Africa. So how do cities become green? Here to help us talk about this, Julian Adjaman is Professor of Urban and Environmental Policy and Planning at Tufts University. Luca Lennison, who heads the Climate Unit for the City of Copenhagen in Denmark. Cassio Taneguchi, the former Mayor of Curitiba in Brazil. And right here in the United States, Joshua Arce is President of the San Francisco Commission on the environment. Good to have you here, guests. Um, this idea about green, I'm just curious, guests, what you think about what is a green city? If you had to define it, Julian, what would it be? Well, I'm going to start by saying I don't believe in the green city. I huh? want to see a sustainable city. Right. And a sustainable city is one where issues of economic uh, empowerment, social justice, and green issues are brought to the fore. I think it's an illusion to talk about a green city because somewhere like Vancouver or San Francisco, these are touted as green cities, but they are virtually unaffordable. They have huge homelessness problems. And so to say green, to me, is meaningless. Oh, Joshua happens to be in San Francisco. Joshua, um, what are you? Are you green? Are you sustainable? Are you eco-friendly? Can you define what San Francisco is? What we're doing with the environment is we're bringing it back to the community at this very important moment. It's it's true. We have an affordability crisis where all the progress we've made on the environment and sustainability won't mean anything if we can't support our communities. Right. So we're doing things like investing in our transportation but making it free for folks, for free. young people, for low-income folks is one wow. example of how we're trying to connect. So you could go on the public transport or the bus and not pay? If your youth or your seniors or your folks with low income, what we've done to really address the important needs of sustainability with community and the environment, we've done things like make the muni passes for our municipal trains and buses free. We're connecting the environment to affordable housing. We're investing in, in energy efficiency to bring down the cost of living. And we're really trying to have a community-driven, holistic approach there that really is spot on with addressing the needs of affordability in San Francisco. Joshua, I'm so glad you said that because that's exactly what so many members of our community are saying is what they're looking for. So this is Rachel. She writes in, you need widespread, affordable, light rail, public transport, green research, construction and spaces, cycling and walking paths and recycling. So a long list there. Uh, but someone else in our community, when we ask what makes a green city to you, this is Brown who says, it's trees, trees, and more trees. So, Luca, clearly there is slight differences among people online on what makes a green city. But for you, is it just about green spaces or is it about that long list of things we read in the first tweet? Well, I think for, for Copenhagen, it's actually both. Uh, we want to have a, a physically green city, which is at attractive for people to move about in because we think the physical attractiveness and uh, also inspires a more 
green and sustainable living in the city. For instance, a lot of the greening along bicycle lanes and so on in Copenhagen is also about making it much more attractive to take the bike rather than to 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 uh, uh, commute by, by car uh, in the city. That's why we have reached rates of 45 people, uh, 45 percent of people, not 45 people, uh, bicycling uh, to work and school every day in the city. So it's it's a it's for us it's very much about the the entire picture because mm. I completely agree um, uh, with Julian that sustainability is much more than just the eco sustainability. It's also about the social sustainability and the economic sustainability of cities. Luca, do you have a bike? Uh, yes, I have a bike. How did you I use it every day? I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't live without my bike. How did you get to work today, Luca? I biked even though it was pouring down. See, this is the thing I don't get. When I go to Copenhagen, there are days that are so awful that I'm thinking, I am so not walking or I'm not getting on a bike. And yet, cyclists are out there in force. What did you do to the population in Copenhagen to persuade them, regardless of the weather, biking is a great idea? <laughs> Yeah, uh, it, it, the weather is horrible sometimes in Copenhagen. Yeah. <laughs> and even when it's snowing, people are biking. Uh, it's because we've made it um, uh, easy to make that choice of, 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 of taking the bike. It's not when people are biking in Copenhagen. I mean, I'm not doing it because I want to be eco-friendly or green or anything like that. I do it because it's the easiest, fastest way to get around. Uh -huh. and, and we've done that. It's been a long period. Uh, it's taken a long time, 30 years, to get to where we are, building bicycle lanes and, and, and making life easier for bicycles rather than making life difficult for, for cars. It's about making it much more attractive to, to, to take your bike. We've been building bridges across the, the harbor and the, in order to make it easier to commute from one part of the city to another. And so it's it's all about making it easy, and and the other good thing about biking is that it's also socially sustainable. It's much cheaper to to buy a bicycle than it is to buy a car, especially in Denmark where we've got enormous taxes on cars. I have to tell you about Curitiba. It's in uh, the southern part of Brazil. It's an amazing place. We have uh, the former mayor of Curitiba with us, uh, Cassio. Why is Curitiba so amazing? When people say, you've got to talk about green cities, your city is mentioned probably nine times out of ten. Why? Well, Curitiba is a different city from South America, Brazil, and uh, Curitiba since the 1970s tried to make a different approach concerning to environmental issues and also the mass transit system. I think Curitiba had the opportunity to reinvent all the transportation systems they invested and is very efficient. And it likely transform uh, the operation of a bus system in a, like a metro underground system. But the most important aspect is it serves the all population in a very affordable way. Right. Uh, even with the increase of uh, cars, uh, we must uh, uh, invert the pyramid, uh, giving priority to pedestrians, right. to people. And Femi, you know, Femi, can I just say something here? Yeah, sure. So, Cassio, yes. Julian's just going to uh, jump in and add yeah. to the conversation. Go ahead, Julian. You know, one of the very interesting things uh, in my research and my understanding is that the original mayor who developed the system, Jaime Lerner, his primary goal in developing this fabulous bus rapid transit system was not greening, it was yes. social equity. He sat there with his uh, colleagues in the city and watched people move around the city. It's a very, very uh, divided city in terms of rich and poor. And his main goal was to provide access to the great institutions of the city by the majority of people. It was not green, oh. but the effect has been green. So this is why I think social justice, equity and greening are so intertwined in these, these great cities like Curitiba. And, uh, you know, Mayor Taniguchi carried on this, uh, this fabulous system. And it, it's happened in Bogota, you know. Um, the, the mayor of Bogotá, the former mayor of Bogotá, um, 
Enrico Peñalosa. His aim was not greening the city when he developed the Transmillennial bus rapid transit system. It was to provide access and mobility to those on low incomes. Right. I, I, I'm just wondering, Joshua, does it have to be a mindset that the city has or does it have to be the culture that has to work hand in hand? I'm trying to work out what it is that makes people want to kind of buy into this. Uh, let's take San Francisco, for instance. I, I'm just going to show people here this very quickly. San Francisco recycles more than 70% of its waste, the highest municipal recycling rate in the US and Canada. You have to make people want to recycle. You can't just have that amazing result without getting everybody on board, right? Well, what I was going to say is I think that every city has its own culture around sustainability or the environment, but there's also a consciousness that we all plug into. And Julian's on to a point here where you have to connect the haves and have nots and we're a city where we're working very hard to address that because where things are moving fast in San Francisco. So you listen to communities, you listen to low income community members, communities of color, what are folks saying in terms of what they need to sustain communities and and how do we create a, a system of say zero waste that gets folks bought into it. We have a clean energy program where we have access to solar panels for folks that want to solarize their home, but we would say a lot of folks who may not have means to do that aren't going to do it, and they're going to miss out on the green economy. So we fix that by saying that if you're low income, you have access to even greater rebates and access to get solar panels through our Go Solar SF program in a way that's happened on thousands of homes throughout the city for tenants as well. We talked about the free municipal transportation pass program, which is essential, and you have to connect it to jobs. Communities want to see an environment that they can look at, that they can feel, and there's no better way to do that than creating jobs in the process. And so I think these are things that have to be done. It's innate to San Francisco, but it's not unique, of course, this idea of innovation, this idea of dreamers that came here and founded our city, which is younger than a lot of the cities that are here on the program, but there is a consciousness that the environment has to mean more than just the sustainability component. It has mm -hmm. to connect social values. It has to address inequity. It has to promote and serve environmental justice. And that's what we are really committed to in San Francisco. And Joshua, I hear what you're saying, but online, not everyone is convinced. So Julian, I want you to see this tweet. This is from Happy. Uh, after uh, the stream tweeted out a quote that you said a little bit earlier, I don't believe in a green city. So Happy says, he agrees. Green is meaningless. Vancouver, as one example, is not sustainable for a great many citizens, i.e. the hundreds to thousands of homeless and me too, he goes on to say. So how do you then walk that balance, walk that fine line of trying to make a city quote unquote green, but also making sure you include people like this? Well, you know, this is, uh, and I'm not going to say for the start that I have all the answers here but when you think about it and think about sort of North American cities especially we now have a walk score a measure of walkability and guess what that correlates with house price the realtors have taken sustainability and taken things like walk scores and Julian, bike that is so true and it's, they've yes. made they've made sustainability a commodity yeah. what I want to see what I want to see is sustainability for the poor people. Uh, what would a sustainable city look like that was predicated on social justice and equity? Julian, what would we're it look like? Is, do we have a city? Does that city exist right now? Well, it, it doesn't, but I've got to say the Latin American cities, Curitiba, Belo Horizonte. Belo Horizonte is the city that abolished hunger. It isn't even mentioned uh, for its, um, its groundbreaking food security policies right. in the Siemens report. Uh, Medellin in Colombia with its social urbanism. My point here, and, and then I'll let the others speak, my point is social justice doesn't just happen. We have to be intentional about it. And anywhere that starts to begin to think about social justice, like Belo Horizonte, and builds a food strategy around social justice, is going to win. So Belo Horizonte spends less than 2% of its annual city budget but it has abolished hunger. It has improved school scores because kids don't go to school hungry. Yeah. It's created jobs for thousands of people who are now um, greening uh, vacant lots and providing urban agriculture and providing food. So my point is, we can't start with green. We have to start with social justice and equity and build our programs around that. All right. Uh, well, look, look, one look, of ahead. the things that... 
one of the things that I've been, I mean, you make it sound as if uh, you would like the Siemens index also to include the social issues. I agree with you on the on the overall agenda saying you can't have a sustainable city without also looking at the social issues. But I think again, in these times also with the COP21, uh, we also have to look at the fact that there's a, a global um, need to act also on the the green sides uh, of the sustainability agenda. And I think in that respect, I think it's interesting that cities are trying to move towards that. Uh, and I think that uh, so, so it's look, not just, the greening just, just that so that makes all, city socially Lucas, just so we're all on the same page. Uh, quickly, the sustainability agenda will be what? You just drop that into the, into the conversation, the green agenda, the sustainability. Because mayors get together around the world and talk about this for the rest of us civilians. Yes. What does that mean? Well, well, the fact is that for many, in many countries, including Denmark, at, at least at the moment, we were just named as fossil of the day at the COP21 in Paris because the Danish government is going back on the green uh, or the, on, the, on the global CO2 emissions agenda. And the cities, on the other hand, I have a much a bigger opportunity to act on these things. And the good things about cities is that they can actually take them hand in hand with a lot of these social issues at the same time. If you're mm. looking at, for instance, the, the plan that we have made in Copenhagen about making the, the city carbon neutral by 2025, it goes hand in hand with a socioeconomic um, program on actually making sure that we do not increase it, the costs of people in the city. We want to make sure that it's still an affordable city to live in. And so, we so are Luke, like many can I, can other... I, 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 I want to make a confession here. Um, I, I told Malika this, um, and she said it was all right that I could mention this to you. I got a, a letter from my uh, electric company this month that said, we are going to go to clean fuel. It's an option for you. And I read through it, and it looked fantastic. And then it said, and your bill will go up. And then I was like, why would I want my bill to go up? And maybe I'm the only person on my block that does that. And Malika, yeah. your response was what? Uh, well, if everyone had that thought, then of course it will never go down, Right. unfortunately. Um, but I think that that's part of what I'm seeing online is people sure. saying this has to be a mindset change individually, person to person, you and me, everyone on your block. Right, and right. so I want to pass it over to you, Joshua, that idea. I know Femi asked you this earlier, but I, I want a more a concerted effort on your part on what you think of this. This is Tom who says, we would have three generations that would feel their throats had been cut if they had to walk further than their house to their car. So that's one example. Here's another one. This is out of the United Arab Emirates. And Halima says, when it comes to plastic and trash there, there are initiatives to make people recycle, but it's not working with so many people. So those are just two examples, biking and trash and recycling. How do you go about making sure that individuals understand how important it is and their own mindsets change? I was actually going to jump in on this very point because I think it's something particular to San Francisco. There is, of course, this notion that we need to work to create this behavioral change. I'm a civil rights attorney is my background, so a lot of my approach is to come from the community to drive these conversations and to speak from community. There's a lot of experts. We have world-renowned experts in San Francisco, but we also want to hear from community members about how we address zero waste. You pointed out what was the other item was around transportation, walking to a car. But this point I wanted to jump in on was the idea that it might cost a little more. In San Francisco, we almost don't have the ability to tell folks especially in our low-income communities or folks that are struggling through this affordability crisis, that it's good for the environment, but it's going to cost a little more. So we worked really hard in San Francisco on a program we're going to roll out next year called Clean Power SF, which is going to be a, a major way in the change of, of mix of clean energy in our households and our businesses. It's going to increase at a drastic level the greenness uh, to use the term, the renewable nature of the electricity that's powering our city and move that up to 100% renewable energy through this program. And we took many years to do it right what because are the taxes we heard like? time and what time are, again what folks state, what can't pay more. What are the taxes like in San Francisco, Joshua? Are, are they significantly we, higher than, than we, other cities that aren't quite as uh, progressive as San Fran? The hit on folks' pocketbooks is not necessarily tax, a, stale, a sales yeah. tax or a 
that type of equivalent, it is really around the cost of living. It is the rents. Uh -huh. It is skyrocketing rents. It is skyrocketing cost of living as uh, just a byproduct of our efforts to address record unemployment. Just five years ago, we turned that around and have now, uh, from a record high of unemployment, a record low in unemployment, and the trade-off was... <laughs> Joshua sounds like he's running for office. <laughs> All right, uh, just take a pause for, between humble bragging for each of your cities. Have a look here. Um, uh, a number of our guests have mentioned Siemens, and we mentioned at the very top uh, the Green City Index. I'm just going to show you the top 10 greenest cities. This is a very controversial list because we're saying, well, uh, and the controversy is, well, who's making the index and from what point of view, what perspective are these the top 10 cities? Maybe you go to somewhere small in a little village, maybe in the middle of the African continent, you might find somewhere where they do 100% recycling and there's no waste whatsoever. Why wouldn't they be at the top? But meanwhile, sitting pretty right up here, Copenhagen. Um, Luca, if another city wanted to topple you, what would they have to do? Uh, well, a lot of cities are trying to topple us at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got Stockholm and Oslo also biting at our yeah. <laughs> heels. So, so it's so we are very. Uh, um, I think it's about looking. Um, the reason why Copenhagen is on the top is because we tend to not score on the top of one thing, but we score very high on most of these things. We both have the sustainable transport. We have 98% of the, uh, uh, the citizens connected to the district heating system, which is a very sustainable way so of Luca, heating. So, what would they have to do? What now... would they have to do to topple you? Then you're telling us why you're at the top, but what would they have to do to beat you? No, but but they would they would basically have to look at as a, a wide range of, of, of things of approaches. Uh -huh. It's not just focusing on one thing. It's about focusing on a lot of things. So, so um, I think it's it's about uh, having the concerted effort all along uh. the range of of, 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 of of life in a city. You know, I think we all want to be top focusing on the transport. But, but, but you know, if you look at the the index, and I've done an analysis of the index, if you look at the North American and European cities, none of the indices are to do with social justice. Whereas mm. if you look at the African and Latin American cities, they have informal settlements, they have more social sure. justice indices. That's a, yeah, that's, if, that's why I said it was if, it's controversial there. If, uh, well, yeah. It should, be, it, it it should be a component. Yeah, it should be, yeah, absolutely. The, Don't get the, me wrong, and I, and I think Copenhagen and I think San Francisco, you're doing some great things. Yeah. You're probably doing as much as you can. But my point is, we're not comparing Apple uh, we, you know, with apples here, we, we, we've got a very different system for the African, Asian and Latin American cities because they have to consider some very, very deep social justice problems, but the index does not have social justice issues. And it's just one index. In we we shouldn't get caught, necessarily caught well, up in sure, there, but sure. it, it gives us an idea yeah. of what some that, cities are yeah. doing. And, and that index is, is so kind of widely promoted, I feel like it is appropriate to mm. almost immediately start incorporating these values because... Myself, I'm raising my family with my wife and I are in the Mission District of San Francisco, which for folks that know, it is ground zero for the affordability crisis in our city. Mm. And around us, we're renters, and others around us have had their rents doubled in just a couple of years. And the only thing that's <clears throat> saved us is the sustainability tool known as rent control uh -huh. for our communities. Yeah, 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 and absolutely. So what does it mean if yeah. we have folks being driven out of communities like the Mission District while our recycling score is great and our walkability yeah. score is great, it doesn't reflect a fully <clears throat> sustainable vision. And this has to be in ec uh, both an environmental guess, and socioeconomic uh, equity index. I had a thought in the, in the final minute, so it's got to be quick. Uh, biggest fail for being green or sustainable is what, Julian? What's the biggest fail you've ever seen in the world? Biggest fail, yeah. I, I think, is somewhere like Vancouver. Which, oh, OK. You know, is, is, <laughs> All right. you know, which is touted Yikes. as being super green, but it is so unaffordable and it has a massive Ouch. homelessness problem. All right, so Vancouver Twitter is now ready to jump online. They will have to because we're almost at the end of the show. Willika, what do you have? So we are putting the question out there to all of you watching. If you were in charge of making your city more eco-friendly, what would you do? We're already getting responses. I'll share this last one. You can design streets to lower or increase temperatures locally. Imagine the energy savings. Julian and Luca, Cassio and Joshua, thank you for joining us on the stream today. Appreciate your time. Take care, everybody.